tell me what's going on in your part of the world, Paul and Pete. Pete, you go first. You live in an exciting region. Nothing much happening in my town. Um, in Chile, uh, there is a plebiscite for to decide if um, Chile will bring in a new constitution on the 17th of December. So that's what's uh, happening here that's worth talking about or mentioning <laughs> without going into a lot of detail. Um, is what about the news from Argentina? Is that uh, making the rounds in Chile? The Definitely. recent election? Yeah. yeah, they're talking a lot about the result of that election in Chile. Yes. And what about, um, do you have any news? You're in the film. I do have some exciting news on my end. Um, but yeah, my exciting news is this book, um, which has arrived today for me. I'm the editor of this book. It's uh, called 21 Futures Tales from the Time Chain. It's, um, it's an anthology of stories which are based in places and universes in which Bitcoin plays a major part. So it's a kind of uh, futuristic and new, interesting take on stories in economics and uh, stuff like that put together. So yeah, I'm happy it's here and available. Do you now. also have a Do you also have a story among the selections? I do have a story. Yeah, we. Um, it was going to be anonymous, and then for some reason, I took anonymous off and said, "No, I want my name to be on it." So yeah, there's one story in As there that's mine, and uh, yeah, it's it's nice to know which one's which. That's great. That's great. Yeah. Well, congratulations, thank, Phil. Thank you very much. Yeah, I mean, back to your plebiscides and stories and news stories. One, our guest is going to be uh, linked to the world of journalism. Is that right, Pete? That is right. So um, today, Diane Nottle is joining us. She is author of American English for World Media is a Manhattan-based writer, editor, and educator. Since 2012, she has coached the international students at the Newmark Graduate School of Journalism at CUNY, where she founded the English for Journalists blog. Okay. Hi, Hi Diane. Sorry for the technical Hi, difficulties. Hi, welcome to The Trouble with Writing. <laughs> yes, Thank welcome. you so much, Diane, for joining us. Well, thanks for inviting me. This is for my first live video podcast, so new experience for me. So we, we just introduced you, and um, you know, one thing that we mentioned was you are author of American English for World Media, and you also yes. have the English for Journalist blog. So we're very right. curious to, to know a little bit about what led you to the blog to create the blog and write the book? Okay. Uh, well, this is all part of a continuum. I, what you didn't say in my intro was I spent 35 years as a, an editor on daily newspapers, including 20 years at the New York Times. Short version of the story is uh, around 2005, I started training to teach English to speakers of other languages as something I might want to do in my retirement. And the opportunity came up a lot sooner than I expected because I finished my certificate program in December 2007. And by 2008, well, we all know what happened in 2008, but in the newspaper business, it started happening six months to a year earlier as we were caught in the crisis of going from print to digital. So I took a buyout from the New York Times, started teaching, not full-time at that point, uh, but like many of these things, as career changers will often find, it snowballs as you get more experience, more contact, and so on. So in uh, 2012, I came to the... Back then, it was the CUNY Graduate School of Journalism. We didn't have the Newmark uh, name yet. Uh, as an experiment, they had a number of international students, and the professors didn't know what to do with them. Should we hold them to the same standards in terms of English as the native speakers? And I say native speakers is 
instead of Americans, because in New York, many people are not native speakers. So they may be Americans, but they may have been brought here as children, might still have one or two things they've got problems with in English, even though they grew up in American schools and so on. And the other thing was, uh, the professors wondered, well, do we cut them some slack? Because we know this is not their first language. And one day my resume got into the hands of the right person who said, we need somebody like you. Can you come in? And I've been there ever since. So the blog started uh, when the head of IT for the school at the time was setting me up in the system. And as he was leaving, he made an offhand comment saying, you know, if you find a lot of the students are making the same mistakes, you might want to blog about that. And I thought, oh, that's a good idea. And that's how English for Journalists got started. Um, I wrote regularly on that until about the first year of the pandemic. The pandemic changed the way we work with students so much that I wasn't finding a lot of problems in common anymore. Also, by that time, I had done nearly a hundred posts, and I had covered most of the grammar points I wanted to cover, and a lot more. So that's how the blog came to be. And every time I would see students, you know, a, a lot of people making similar mistakes, I would collect, I would call it harvesting examples from student work. And then when I felt I had enough, I'd put them together in a blog post. The book grew out of the blog, at that time, uh, the journalism school had its own little publishing branch. And for years, people said, you've got to write a book for us. You've got to write a book for us. Someone in the UK had done a book called English for International Journalists, which is why my book is not called that. And we all passed around and thought, this isn't really that good. We can do better. And so we did. And it was published, it unfortunately came out four days before the 2016 presidential election, so it was somewhat overshadowed. But people who have it seem to love it. I find it and just incredibly useful to have in my teaching. So that's the origin story. Uh, you may not know, I've also done another book in China in collaboration with the Chinese translation professor called English Grammar and Writing. It's more of a textbook slash workbook. And that's um, you can look at that on my website, dianonald.com. So that's the story. That was, I could tell you're a journalist, Diane. That was a very detailed backstory. Very, very thorough backstory like that. That's what we do. And I, as a journalist, I tend to write long. Um, I always want to tell people every detail, which, of course, journalists can. But that's the kind of writer I am and probably the kind of talker I am. Diane, I, I loved your blog. I started... Uh, researching and looking at your blog the other day. And I must say, I f it resonated with me because I do something a little bit similar. I host a weekly live stream and I also harvest uh, student examples. Um, sometimes I, I adjust them a little bit to disguise uh, the original piece, but I, I sort of analyze them live uh, on my whiteboard. So I love what you're doing with that. I think... Um, a learner, but also a teacher can benefit a lot from that. Just seeing how you can dig into um, uh, flawed English and find some gems of uh, uh, wisdom in there about the tendencies that writers have, the tendencies, grammatical or stylistic. So very cool, very interesting. Uh, great. Is uh, I think it's me with the next question. Uh, great. Diane, some writers like to publish in second language in the future, but they say that they n don't need to work on their English skills because they're working in their first language. What would you advise them to do? Stick with the first language, a mix of the two? Stay. English concurrently. And here's why. I don't think what these writers want to do is, I don't know, maybe this is what they're thinking. Maybe they haven't thought that far ahead yet, but they may be thinking, 
Well, first I need to establish myself as a writer or reporter in my own language. And then later I want to branch out and publish in English. It's possible, but I don't think that that sounds like a very abrupt and artificial transition to me. It takes a long time to master a language. Um, a lot of Americans, you know, the people who say you're an American now speak English and they assume, well, you know, it, it's an easy thing to pick up in a language. Either you should know the language perfectly before you arrive here or should, you should be able to pick it up as soon as you're here. As we all know, this is not the case. It takes years for most people to master a language. And a lot of Americans don't really like to study foreign languages. And so they haven't made the effort. Whenever I hear somebody say, you're an American, speak English. My question is, and how many languages have you studied? So they don't know how much time at work it takes. So I would say, by all means, if you're a young writer starting out, of course, you want to start in your own language. But when the day comes that you want to publish in English, you have to be prepared. So work on your English at the same time. You don't need to be working at the same level as you are in your own language, but you want to get a feel for what it's like working in English. You know, how is it different? As we all know, languages are not direct translations of each other. There are some things that the way you say it in one language does, just does not compute in English. For example, at CUNY some years ago, I had a Japanese student who, she was, I would say, kind of a high intermediate, but she hadn't mastered a lot of things, especially idiom yet. So she would do direct translations of how she would say something in Japanese. And then I could look at it and we might have to talk it through a little bit, but together we could come up with the English idiom and therefore she would learn that. So um, certainly learning idiom is very important when you're trying to master another language. And I find my students love studying idiom. But what I always tell them is there are two parts to mastering an idiom. First of all, to understand it when you hear it. But second, if you're going to use it in either writing or speaking, you have to get it exactly right or your audience is not going to understand you. So uh, if you feel you might want to publish in English someday, start working on it now in any way you can. Diane, along those same lines, what place do you think reading has for such a learner, um, particularly a journalist learning to become a journalist and use English? What place reading should reading is, have in there? Reading is incredibly important because reading is how we learn to write. I've written a memoir of how I studied languages through my whole life, uh, as, as yet unpublished. Uh, the first chapter is memories of how did I learn English, my own language? This is something we don't have to think about. And so much of it is about my reading, starting when I was a small child, going all the way through high school, because that's as far as that chapter goes. So even though the goal, especially in journalism, is to develop your own voice, your own style of writing, you do that through reading other people's writing. You know, you see Hemingway had a style, which is certainly not mine. Fitzgerald had a style. Any writer you admire, you Probably the reason for your admiration is because of that writer's voice. So by reading many writers and in various kinds of media, books, news, um, essays, magazines, you get a feel for how writers express themselves. And that will give you um, a better sense of how to express yourself and develop your own individual voice. So one thing I do suggest when you're reading in English, 
don't rush it. I had a student of mine from China when she was in grad school in New York a few years ago said, how do you do it? I mean, how do you read? She had a stack of required books like that and could never keep up. And when I was in college, so did I. And I raced through most of these books, mainly so I could pass the exams, get through the semester, with the result that I I retained very little of them. And once I graduated, I decided I am not going to do that anymore. I read a lot for pleasure. I'm going to read at my own pace. And of course, that pace depends on what you're reading. I go through, you know, journalism quite quickly because I read so much journalism, I pretty much know what it's going to say. But I also read lots of books and I find each book has its own rhythm. Some I can just race through some. You really have to slow down. Uh, For English language learners, of course, there is the matter of vocabulary and idiom. Uh, I suggest reading ebooks if possible because, you know, you touch it, the word, and the dictionary comes up if you don't know it. So that's a huge help if you don't have an e reader, um, if you're reading paper books keep a notebook of words you don't understand, look them up, Uh, look them up in online dictionaries so you can also get the pronunciation. So that kind of went from the, the macro to the micro. Read as much as you can. And if you want to be a journalist, especially read or watch or listen in the medium that you would like to work in. If you want to be a writer, read writing. Uh, if you want to be in broadcast or podcast or whatever, listen and watch in those fields. And it, it gives you a better sense of the media culture and what's going to be expected of you. Thank you. That's really, really insightful. Reading is something my students always want to avoid for some reason. And I emphasize it. It's difficult. I mean, I tried reading books in French, which is my my first, second language, uh, and the one I know best. But my French is also very rusty because I don't get a chance to practice very much. And so I once, I was in a cafe in Poland that had books lying around, and it was The Mists of Avalon. Uh, It's the novel about the Arthurian legends from the women's point of view. And I started reading it and I found, oh, this is really good. I'm going through the first couple of pages, not having much trouble. But it is hard work to read a full book in a second language. I have a Chinese student at CUNY now. She loves to read books in English, you know, novels. But it takes her a long time. And because she's got so much coursework, she says, you know, I'd really like to be able to read this novel. So uh, just keep telling them how important it is. And of course, for me, reading has always been a pleasure. If you can in some way make them see that it is and should be a pleasure, maybe they need to, you know, maybe they're so focused on reading for their coursework that's not fun. But remind them, you know, there are other things you can read. I had a PhD student in Poland once, and she was saying how hard it was to understand things. And what I said is, you need to read some trash. You need to read a romance novel or something like that. Maybe a mystery if you like that. I think I gave her a copy of Vanity Fair magazine. And she said, of course, being a doctoral student, oh, I don't have time for that. But you need it. It's almost like an antidote to all that academic language. Those are some great tips about, about readings. Yeah, I think especially with students, they're just so under pressure to read these heavy texts and you know, they I, always think that reading has to bring them some kind of results, just like read things that you already know, or, like you say, yeah. Right. Um, I'm both odd and lucky because starting when I was a teenager, I've been in the habit of I read every morning when I wake up and every night before I go to sleep to the extent that if I don't read, I can't fall asleep. And if I don't read in the morning, I never quite wake up that day. So and people think that's 
kind of odd but remarkable. It's just a good habit I've gotten into, and um, you know I've gotten through a lot of books, and I get through two newspapers every morning before I get out of bed. So reading is a great pleasure to me, and. If you can instill that in your students, I think they'll find it a lot easier. Going back to what Paul said about um, to students that don't want to read, right? and um, it's obviously such a crucial part of being a good writer, you have to be a good reader. I wanted to move it on a little bit to ask you about the writing process. Um, I was wondering if you could give your top three tips on developing an effective writing process in English as a second language? I've been thinking about that. And the first thing is, this is really important. So everybody, please work on this. If you are still at the stage of thinking in your native language and then translating into English, whether on, you know, doing a full story and then translating it on paper or translating thoughts in your head as you're writing, uh, get out of that habit. Because what first semester students at CUNY every year are still thinking in their native languages when they're trying to write in English. Well, journalism is a fast business. You have to be able to produce quickly on deadline. And that slows you down. So again, it's a process just to do this. But when you are writing in English, do your best to think in English. And that becomes easier, like everything, with the more practice you have. Some years ago at CUNY, I had another student from China. And I asked her at one point, are you thinking in Chinese or English when you're writing in English. She said, mostly in English, but every now and then there's a word or a phrase I don't quite know in English. So I fall back on the Chinese and then fix it later. Okay. So she's taken another step, but you got to start thinking in English to write well, and especially if you need to write fast in English. So just Think in English whenever possible. Um, one thing that this comes to me from a now retired professor at the CUNY Journalism School, whom I interviewed for my book. And he was a professor, actually, he was the head of Craft, which is the two main reporting courses. And he always told students, before you turn it in, find somebody to read it. And they, oh, but can't do that. Um, you know, there's no time because these people were writing on a two hour deadline at that point. But he said, you've got to stop yourself a half hour before the deadline, hand it to someone who can tell you if it makes sense. Not necessarily the fine tuning uh, of the language, but do you understand this piece? Uh, because when you're writing anything, and especially journalism, it's clear in your head because you're the one who's done all the research. You know what the story's about. That doesn't necessarily mean you convey it clearly to the reader. And, you know, I, I think the thing my students hear from me most often is don't assume readers know. Always go into a story assuming that your reader knows nothing about what you're writing about. Uh, I happen to coach a lot of students at CUNY who are in the business and economics program. Now, I, when it comes to business writing, I should be reading a book called Business for Dummies. I've never worked in financial journalism. Uh, it was pretty much the one desk of the Times I never worked on. I don't know a lot about it, which means I'm a great reader for these students because they're throwing around these financial terms they've learned in class. I have no idea what they're talking about. So I say, who's that? What's this? Needs a few words of ID. That's the kind of feedback you need from a first reader. And um, I'm going to give you four tips instead of three. I'll try to do them quickly. The second one comes from another professor I interviewed for my book. 
And he, he says, outlaw. And then he goes on to say, now, my students always say, oh, but I don't have time to outline. And his response was, you don't have time not to outline. You've got to have a skeleton for your writing before you can do it. Because if you just think you're going to start sit down and start writing, you're paralyzed. I mean, I've been through bouts of writer's block. I know what it feels like. It's too big a thing to take on. If you've got an outline of any kind, then you've you've got something to hang your information on. So it doesn't have to be a formal outline, you know, Roman numeral one, A, B, C, one, two, three. When I'm writing a story, I generally know what my lead, my beginning is going to be. So I'll take some time and really craft the first couple of paragraphs when I'm reasonably happy with that. I'll just kind of sketch it out. You know, what's the next topic I want to cover and the next and the next. And then I can go back and fill in the supporting information. So get in that habit of outlining. Should the outline be in English? Sorry to interrupt. In English, Diane, the outline? uh, I Well, if you're... If you're outlining in English, that means you're thinking in English, and that's the goal. So, yeah, I would say if you possibly can, do your outline in English. And, of course, if you're a journalist, take your notes in English. Don't take it in your native language because it's easier. Okay. Uh, Third thing, learn from being edited. And, of course, a lot of people starting out, aren't really edited, but say you are at the stage where you may be starting to get published. If you're lucky, you will have an editor who has the time to work with you. And I always felt teaching, especially with young journalists, is a big part of the editing process. So try to find someone who can edit you. Uh, That might mean you know, if you can afford it, hiring a coach of some time. Uh, one of our students at CUNY who's about to graduate applied, I think, three times before he was accepted. The first time I interviewed him for admissions to assess his English, about all he could say was, I know my English is not the best. He kept repeating it, repeating it. A year later, I interviewed him again. I could not believe the difference in his conversation. And he said, well, I've been working with uh, an English teacher privately. It made all the difference. He got in and he's about to graduate. I've read a couple of the pieces that he wrote this semester. He's fantastic. So seeking out someone who can work with you and help you along is a really good idea if you have something. Now, of course, if you're not living in an English-speaking culture, you may not know any native speakers. When I first went to Poland, we were, this was back in 2007, the students in my practicum program were about the only native English speakers the people in that city ever came in contact with. That's all changed, of course. It's become a big IT center. They do business all over Europe, and English is the language. So availability is um, you know, a problem in some places. On the other hand, there are lots of good people teaching online now. One student I interviewed for CUNY last year ended up choosing NYU, but hired me as her coach to prepare her over the summer, and I'm still working with her this fall. So if you have someone, preferably a native speaker, who can help you, grab the opportunity. Those were quite some tips, Diane. (laughs) That was um, like an amazing five-minute value-packed section where everyone can, you know, listen to those tips and take something from it. Um, Yeah, and I'm happy to hear you say hire a teacher or a coach. That's definitely a a good move, right? (laughs) It's about feedback. I mean, if we we write and don't get any feedback, then it's hard to improve. Like, you can improve certain aspects, but it's nothing like you know, getting an editor's opinion, as I'm sure you know. I think also, guys, maybe you have this experience in your own coaching. When you coach and you give feedback and 
over time, your writer gets familiar with the sort of patterns that you point out to them. And the suggestions may form a tendency or a pattern in your feedback. And what I think that does is, as they go forward without you, just like a parent teaching a child how to tie the shoes, you, they carry your voice in their mind and they anticipate your feedback when they're writing. And what that does, I think, is it conditions them to consider the reader's perspective the way they would try to please you by making the correction that you're always pointing out. So I think it, that feedback for me is always the most valuable thing that you can give your student because it, 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 it conditions them to write better by thinking about how it reads for someone. And Diane, as you pointed out earlier about uh, giving it to someone else, if for some reason you can't do that, or even if you can do it, you should also develop the, the skill of not writing for the reader necessarily, but considering what they know when they know it as they read through your piece, right? Because right. your job is to dish out the information, and as you said, assume the reader knows nothing. So you have to build the idea for them, right? Right. And you said something very important. Consider the reader, because a lot of people have not. A few years ago when I was teaching in China, I was asked to give some workshops for administrators who were now expected to produce English language content. They had trained as academics. Uh, sorry, Paul, I hate academic writing, but that's for another time. Uh, as a journalist, I, I come from a different world. But the way I've come to see it recently is when you're writing academically, I think you are writing to record information that you have learned, not necessarily to communicate. You're writing to pass the course, to get your doctorate, and then your dissertation goes in the library, and maybe some future scholar will consult it. In my world of journalism, you are always writing for the public, for readers, and so you really need to think about that. Um, one of my current students at CUNY, I asked her not even a year ago, uh, so who are you writing this piece for? And she said, oh, it's for my professor. It's for class. I said, no. In journalism, you are always writing for a reader. Think about how the reader is going to understand this. Yeah, that's, that's a really great uh, little gem there because when I teach students academic writing, they always say the same thing. They're always saying, I'm oh, writing good. this for my professor. But what I tell them is, yeah, but what if the professor shows it to their friends and wives and husbands and colleagues, and then mm -hmm. they want to publish it and it goes out into the whole world? You're writing for anybody, right? Who's exactly. interested in that learning about that topic. Yeah. That's the great thing you just said, because especially when I'm editing students who are writing in the business program or sometimes the science program. Um, and now I've just lost my train of thought. Sorry about that. Uh, tell me, what did you say just before this? Oh, uh, sorry. Uh, gosh. Oh, about uh, writing, not just for your professor, but for anyone they may pass along to. Okay. So what I'm it, always it, telling them is you want your piece to be comprehensible to anybody who in the olden days picks up the newspaper or these days maybe stumbles across your piece online. Uh, you know, maybe there was a link to your piece in somebody else's piece and now the reader has come to you. It doesn't matter how the person got there, but whoever picks it up, you want to make your piece understandable. Otherwise, they're not going to read it. The goal is to be read. We've just had a really interesting question come in. Um, I'm not sure I've thought about this that much before. Um, but yeah, I wondered if I could, if we could get your opinion on it, Dan. Uh, so Layla is saying, what's the difference here between British and American writing? Is there one? I love this so much because when I teach a course, as I've done several times, in um, the first time I taught it was in China, it was called Cultures of English-Speaking Nations. And I've done it several times now in various places. 
I always do one full class sessions on the differences between British and American and also uh, Australian and a little bit of Canadian English because they are very different. It's not just the accents. Definitely the accent is a big one. And I always do clips of not just British and American, but which British and American accents? You know, we have all kinds of regional accents. In Britain, you've got the difference, not only the regional differences, but also the class differences, which I think are more pronounced than class differences are in American English. But it's also a matter of vocabulary and idiom especially. So that carries over to the writing. Um, I have a piece from the New York Times uh, by Roger Cohen, who I think might now be the chief of the Paris Bureau, but at that time he was kind of a foreign affairs uh, columnist, and it's called Of Lou's and Language. Lou, of course, is the British for bathroom, toilet, whatever. And in it, he, he talks about some of these different words, like an American truck is a lorry in British. Um, uh, things like that. And many, many um, words and idioms that having lived in the UK briefly, I'm aware of. But, uh, you know, it, if I have a student from a non-English speaking country who has learned British English, as many have, well, they'll be using what I call Britishisms in their writing or speech. I say, okay, but in America, where you are now, this is what we say. And of course, they're not aware of the differences. So yeah, vocabulary, possibly the way you write and structure your sentences. Um, in American journalism, we like to be very direct, a lot of active voice, strong, simple. Possibly in British journalism, you know, maybe they write in a little more roundabout way. So it's maybe the difference between, I don't know, Henry James and Joan Didion, something like that. Henry James, of course, was an American, but of a different era, and he spent a lot of his life in the UK. Anyway, so yes. So again, go back to that question of who is your audience? If you're writing for a British audience, write more in the British way and definitely using that vocabulary. If you're writing for an American audience, simple, direct, maybe a little less formal, much like the cultures themselves. That's fascinating. I'd be, I'd be curious to ask Lila here if she can distinguish our four accents. Oh, that's a good question. <laughs> because we're, we represent exactly this right here. Lila, yeah. can you tell the difference in the way the four of us pronounce and speak? It'll probably take her a few moments. Yeah, it'll take it'll take her a few moments. Well, yeah. you're the one oh, wearing the suit, Paul. Looking very, uh, you're very formal today. So, <laughs> right. So while waiting for um, Lila's reply, um, I also wanted to ask you, Diane, about imposter syndrome. So, um, oh, yeah, when great one. <laughs> So when non-native English writers say things like, I will never write as well as a native writer, or they say editors will always prefer to work with native writers, what words of encouragement can you give those non-native English writers whose imposter syndrome do it anyway. is holding them yeah. do it anyway? Uh, right? for, first of all, I believe that the only people who don't have imposter syndromes are the ones who should. I, I could name names, but I won't. Okay. Um, just, just make your best effort. I mean, I have one former student. We are still working on her imposter syndrome. She came from a small town in Brazil and thinks, I'm not qualified to do this. Yes, she is. I came from a small town in Pennsylvania and I wasn't, you know, brought up to do this either. So we're all kind of imposters. What we need to do is learn how to believe in ourselves. And the way we do that is by doing the work, taking the steps. Sometimes it's one step at a time, but doing the work, 
to, I don't know, maybe we never get over it, but at least we produce something. So I don't think you necessarily need to feel you, I don't, maybe you'll never write exactly the way a native English speaker would, but for one thing, that's why we have editors. In terms of editors will always prefer to work with a native speaker? Not necessarily. Now, it's funny. I know a, a number of New York Times retirees who think, oh, the, the editing in the paper has really gone downhill. And some of them say, now these are older people, well, probably a lot of these new writers aren't native English speakers because I see the names on their bylines. They're not quote unquote, American names. And you're right. We have reporters with names from all over the world now. Doesn't mean they're not native English speakers. For all you know, they, their parents may have been immigrants. They may have been born here and educated here. So that is not a fair judgment. Uh, I think that if editing has gotten bad, it's because the editing system has been allowed to break down. The last 10, 15 years, as newspapers and probably other outlets have laid off people, they've laid off the editors rather than writers, or not necessarily laid off, but reduced staff. But first of all, editors like to stick their fingers in copy. We remember editors have egos too. Our names mostly do not go on the story. So we have to make our presence felt somehow. So we want to go in there and mostly get our hands dirty. Uh, really edit. You know, sometimes it's structure. Sometimes it's language. Sometimes it's phrasing. We like doing our jobs. So that's one thing about it. Um, again, sorry, I've lost my train of thought for the moment. <sighs> I loved what you said about um, okay. do it yes, anyway. Do it so it's the US, do it anyway. Um, yeah, do, do, do it anyway. Uh, because the more practice you get, the more comfortable you'll get. So editors, getting back to them, we do want to do our job. We enjoy improving copy. And one thing that people may not know about the process of being edited at its best, it should be a relationship. People think, well, you know, the writer, some writers think, well, my work is already perfect. Why do these people muck it up? The fact is, it's probably not perfect. And writers with big egos, that can be a problem. But especially if you're a new writer and a new writer in English, if you go in there with the attitude of what I said before, I want to learn from the editing process. That builds you a rapport if you have an editor you can work with. I mean, to me, the ideal situation, um, smaller newspapers don't have the time for this, but at the times where we edit everything to death, um, the ideal was always when I'm editing something, have the writer sitting right next to me, looking over my shoulder, and we can go through it together. I could ask my questions, I could explain my edits, and so on. And that's pretty much how I worked at CUNY all these years. Uh, when I was, I'm still working remotely, and so when I was in there doing office hours, that's how it would function. Now, thanks to the miracle of screen sharing, it works pretty much the same online. And it's that back and forth and that give and take. That is how you learn to improve as a writer. So that's why I say learn from the, the process of being edited. Here's a oh, I know what question. I was about to say. Sorry, on. I know what I was about to say about <laughs> editors that went out of my head. Um, Non-native speakers might look at their copy or papers or whatever, and I've, I've had this happen many times, and they say, oh, so many mistakes, and they get very discouraged, and 
my response is no, don't think of them as mistakes. Think of them as improvements. Editors aren't there to, to call you out on your mistakes. They're to help you improve. Our job is to make you look good and you're the one who gets the byline. So the whole world thinks you are really smart. But I always tell them, and I've, I've saved some examples. If I were still half a block away at the New York Times, editing professional reporters, native speakers with 40 years experience, it would probably still look like your copy. I mean, some people turn in very clean copy and some, no matter what they write, no matter how long they've been writing, as we say in the newsroom, their copy look, is lit up like a Christmas tree with all these colors and notes on it. This is the normal editing process. So what you want to do, if you truly want to improve, don't go on an ego trip and say, no, it's already fine the way it is. Listen to your editor and learn from that. I was just, I was just thinking um, that I always like to say to second language English writers that if you have a story that's really worth telling, the original story, then even if the Eng your English is not perfect, it's not going to be perfect. There's going to be things that you need to improve. The editor's going to be more interested in that story than someone who doesn't have an interesting original story, who is a native speaker, even if they have you know, really uh, top quality writing skills in English. Mm -hmm. Exactly. I wanted to comment, Diane, on your thoughts on editors that um, I, I really resonate what you said about building relationships. I think that's the way I work with students and, um, you know, editors have, have worked with me as well. It's like you need to build that back and forth relationship. If you can do that on a live video call while editing, like on Google Docs or something, that's so helpful. And, yeah, the other thing I wanted to mention is it, goes to show what we're talking about here with you know um writers with english as a second language using english getting published you know writing great articles and working with editors goes to show how important editing is because essentially editors are like the only people apart from a few coaches like us who are aiding and this, uh, the process of like, what is acceptable English? What is the best use of language for these pieces to be published and to be held up on a pedestal? Like this is the work that we're aiming for. So it is so important that we keep going um, with it, even now when, you know, newspapers especially are like under such pressure to sack editors. We need them more than ever because so many more people are using English wanting to write it, we really exactly. need to know where the where the line is for like acceptable use and best use. Right, and I have always thought of editors as the reader's representative. The editors are the first readers. You know, you finish your copy, you turn it in to whoever reads it first. Uh, when I was at the Times, there were three different levels of editing. Now they've streamlined that process for better or worse. But the fact is, the editor is the person who's reading your story. And if your editor doesn't understand it, the reader is not likely to understand it. The editor is probably going to know more already going into the story than the person who reads it in the morning. And I always quote uh, a late friend of mine. She was a writing buddy of mine. And this applied mainly in the days of morning newspapers. Now, of course, we can get the news anytime we want. But she always said, you're writing for people who may not have had their second cup of coffee yet. You know, they may be reading the morning paper or whatever, but their brains may not be fully functioning yet. They may or may not know anything about your topic, but they're reading it anyway. So that's why everything has to be so clear. I like that. It's, yeah, um, second cup of yeah that's yet. great. Yeah. We've touched on this idea of the editor as the reader's representative. And as I pointed out earlier, as coaches, we are sort of fulfilling that role too. And I know yes. that feeling, I know that experience of, putting a lot of commentary and notes on a student's work 
And it can really shut them down because they're trying to please you because they've also been trained to write something that's good enough to pass and get a grade. What yeah, I've actually it, started doing is instead of putting any negative criticisms, unless I can, can't avoid it, in the commentary, I'll let the AI stuff do that, like the grammar checkers <laughs> and the spell checkers. I'll let the AI stuff be the bad guy, and all of my commentary will be constructive or suggestive uh, advice. So I get to be their hero, and what I've noticed is they, they get more encouraged to see their, their feedback as exactly what you're describing, as helping them get to the polished final product rather than this is wrong and that's wrong. Exactly. Um, but uh, yeah. I, I want to take that a little further. And, and you mentioned some of the changes in the editing uh, mm -hmm. field. Mm -hmm. Given those changes, what do you think is the now the current writing landscape for someone who wants to write, say, as a freelance journalist? What, what are the... What are the changes that are that you've noticed, um, sort of parallel to the changes in editing in the editing field? In terms of, you mean just getting started in freelancing? Yeah, the opportunity yeah. landscape, I suppose. I haven't done much freelancing in recent years. Um, this is just me. I love doing the, the work, but I'm really bad at marketing and self promotion, and I just decided. I'd like to spend my energy elsewhere. So I don't have anything much that's up to date. It's getting getting noticed, getting the attention, getting those first few assignments. And once you've done that, again, this is about establishing a relationship with an editor or a publication. Once you've done that, you become one of their regulars and they'll they'll go to you if they need something done it's not always you having to pitch something to them and that's a giant step forward when they start seeing you as one of their gang so that helps a lot um the main difference i see in the editing process is as i said at the times we used to have three levels of editors um the assigning or content or story editor, which is what I was when I left. The copy desk, which is what I was when I went in there. Um, less responsible for content, although making great contributions to content, but more with the mechanics of style, structure, grammar, you know, that whole thing. And then the chief copy editor on each desk who was the last person to see a story before it was set in type. And in recent years, that's become, compressed is the wrong word, but the new way of doing it is you have one editor who is responsible for a story all the way through from conception to pushing the button. And in fact, some smaller sections at the times, that's how we operated as opposed to the major desks. The problem with that is some editors have never learned the copy desk functions. They came in as you know content people. Um, some copy editors have never been taught to think bigger. So it's kind of rare to find the skills to get it you know, to do all those things in one person. And that's the thing I see as having changed. But for people starting out, it's it's the getting noticed and becoming one of their people. That's that's the important thing. And, and again, it's all about building relationships. Diane, that's, that's, great. Um, that's great. Thank you, Diane. Yeah, yeah thanks, Thank thanks so much for all your valuable tips today there's so much um our audience has learned i think you're more than welcome yeah and uh, i hope your second podcast experience went uh went smoothly <laughs> may there be many many more because you've got so much great advice to to give out to up-and-coming writers you. and you know we really thank it's, you for coming on it's a learning experience for me too so thank you brilliant okay let's wrap it up everyone uh, thanks for watching and um oh diane before we go where can people find you online would you like to share a, a social media or a website 
I tend to stay away from social media. I think it's a cesspool. So my website is very simple, dianoddle.com. And of course, there is my blog. This has a very long URL, English for Journalists, all run together at journalism.cuny, that's C-U-N-Y dot E-D-U. Or if you just Google English for Journalists CUNY, it will come up. That's great. We'll include those links in the show notes. Uh, brilliant. All right. Thanks for watching, Thank everyone. You so much. And we'll great. be back next month with another episode. <laughs>